So uh, we're ready for our final student talk of the symposium by Jonathan Ma. Jonathan is currently a senior at Harker. He began conducting research in eighth grade when he did a project on the effects of temperature on the power output of photovoltaic cells. Since then, motivated by an interest in computer science and biology, he has worked predominantly in bioinformatics. For the past two summers, Jonathan has worked in the Beck Lab at Harvard Medical School. During junior year, he and, he and his partner, Sadika Malati, uh, were named Siemens regional finalists for their project on sex differences in cancer and sex-specific treatments. This year, Jonathan was named a Siemens semi-finalist and Intel finalist for the project he's about to present on the study of cancer and its treatment through genomics. He became interested in this specific area because it allows him to apply theoretical knowledge to solve pressing problems with practical benefits for patients. Aside from research, Jonathan enjoys participating in various scientific contests. He has participated in the Physics Olympiad since ninth grade and was named one of 20 US physics team members in 2015. He is also the captain of the Upper School Science Bowl team and the head coach of the Middle School Science Bowl team. Please welcome Jonathan. Thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jonathan Ma, and today I'll be presenting my project, Genomics-Based Cancer Drug Response Prediction Through the Adaptive Elastic Net. According to Duffy and Crown, currently cancer treatment is limited to one-size-fits-all options, which often perform poorly in practice due to heterogeneity across patients. Customization of cancer treatment is only available based on the presence or absence of individual biomarkers, such as overexpression of HER2 in breast cancers. However, personalized treatment has the potential to yield vast improvements over traditional therapeutic options by minimizing toxicity and maximizing clinical benefit for each patient. The next step towards truly personalized treatment lies in the development of computational models to rationally predict drug response based on genomics features. In order to achieve this aim, large training data sets integrating genomics data, drug pharmacological profiles, and drug response data have been developed. The dimensionality of these data sets, however, presents a problem for current machine learning algorithms. Consider a typical genomics feature matrix, X, where the rows represent cell lines and the columns represent genomic features. The tens of thousands of genomic features in a typical genomics feature matrix, X, greatly outnumber the hundreds or even dozens of cell lines. Current machine learning algorithms tend to overfit when trained on such dimensionally imbalanced data, yielding poor predictive performance in practice. This phenomenon is known as the P greater than M problem, and in, uh, and in order to offer truly viable options for personalized treatment, more um, accurate mo models of drug response based on patient genomics are needed. So I developed a computational framework to attempt to address this problem. The framework is based on Zhou and Zheng's adaptive elastic net, which was implemented in the GCDNet package in R. I then validated our, uh, this framework through statistical and biological analysis, and I use it to identify novel associations between genomic features as well as pathways and drug response. So the adaptive elastic net attempts to address the P greater than M problem by incorporating relationships between its response variables into its learning. This results in a phenomenon known as transfer learning, in which information gained from modeling one variable is used to improve the accuracy of modeling of related response variables. Now, many chemotherapeutics have highly similar mechanisms of action, often targeting the same target genes or the same pathways. I hypothesized that by taking advantage of these relationships, the adaptive elastic net would be able to offer improved predictive accuracy compared to current state-of-the-art methods. So let's take a look at how the adaptive elastic net actually works. So here is a typical uh, genomics-based drug response modeling problem. The goal of this modeling is to find a matrix of regression coefficients beta, such that when the genomics feature matrix X mentioned earlier is multiplied by beta, the resulting uh, matrix closely approximates the matrix of drug responses Y. 
this is the current state of the art approach for modeling, uh, for modeling drug response, the traditional elastic net. The coefficient matrix beta is found by minimizing the sum of the L2 norm of the errors plus the regularization components, which in turn depend on the L1 and L2 norms of the regression coefficient matrix it itself. This prevents overfitting. The adaptive elastic net differs from this only in the feature-specific penalty factor W sub J highlighted in red. This feature-specific penalty factor is responsible for the transfer learning phenomenon described earlier. Concretely, suppose that feature J is strongly predictive of, of response to drug 1. Then the regression coefficient beta sub J comma 1 will be large in magnitude. Therefore, the row sum beta sub J will be large in magnitude, and the feature-specific penalty factor W sub J will be small due to the negative exponent minus gamma. Because of the small feature-specific penalty factor, all regression coefficients corresponding to feature J, highlighted in red on the right, will be more likely to be non-zero in subsequent iterations. Therefore, if feature J is strongly predictive of response to drug 1, the adaptive elastic net also includes it as a, more, uh, as a higher probability predictor of response to the related drugs 2 through Q. So the input data for the adaptive elastic net in this study were derived from two primary sources. Gene expression and DNA copy number data were derived from the cancer cell line encyclopedia, or CCLE. And point mutation data was obtained from the catalog of somatic mutations in cancer, or COSMIC. Three histology features, histology, histological subtype, and primary site were added also from the CCLE. All features were min-max scaled. The output data matrix Y consisted of drug activity area values derived from the CCLE. We chose drug activity area as a metric of drug response because it captures both the potency and the efficacy of each drug in each cell line. So the models generated by the adaptive elastic net were trained and assessed using tenfold cross-validation. Of the M equals 430 cell lines, each drug response model was trained on 387 cell lines, comprising 90% of the data, and the error was assessed on the remaining 10% of cell lines not seen during training. This process was repeated across 10 folds, and the errors were averaged. The same process was used to train two other machine learning algorithms, the traditional elastic net as well as the lasso. And the adaptive elastic net yielded a mean 10-fold cross-validated predictive error, 24.1% lower than the error of the next best option, the current state-of-the-art traditional elastic net. We then biologically and statistically validated our approach. Here, we perform hierarchical unsupervised cluster analysis on the regression coefficient matrices generated by both the adaptive elastic net and the traditional elastic net. In both dendrograms, drugs with related mechanisms of action cluster close together, as indicated in the colored highlights. This suggests that the adaptive elastic net successfully selected features relative to, relevant to the mechanisms of action of each drug in its models, thereby confirming the biological validity of our approach. Bootstrap analysis was conducted with Z equals 100 resamples to calculate bootstrap frequency of inclusion of each feature as a measure of statistical significance. We define an association between a feature and a drug response as significant if the association has a frequency of inclusion more than two standard deviations greater than the mean frequency of inclusion of that feature, in accordance with the procedure developed by Garnett et al. in 2012. Effect size, on the other hand, measured the magnitude of these associations, and effect size exactly equaled the regression coefficients in each case, as all features had been min-max scaled already prior to learning. A positive effect size indicates an association with sensitivity to the drug, while a negative effect size indicates an association with resistance to the drug. Now, the adaptive elastic net correctly identified known target genes as predictors of response to several drugs. For instance, EGFR in-frame deletion was identified as the most significant and strongest biomarker of sensitivity to the EGFR inhibitors, erlotinib and ZD6474. Similarly, participatory genes in the target pathways of several drugs were also correctly identified as predictors of response. For instance, uh, a MAP2K7 splice site SNP was correctly identified as a significant and strong predictor of response to the drugs AZD6244 and PD032591. 
Both of these drugs inhibit the RAS, RAF, MEK, MAPK proliferative pathway, in which MAP2K7 is a participatory gene. There, uh, this result thus confirms the biological validity of our approach. Similarly, a RAF1 missense mutation was uh, also associated with sensitivity to the latter drug. Besides these known biomarkers and uh, participatory genes of target pathways, other biomarkers of drug response that have been validated with prior literature were also correctly identified. For instance, copy number of the HDAC9 gene, inhibition of which was observed by Carson et al. to significantly defeat resistance to MEK inhibitors, was associated with resistance in both of these drugs. And both of these drugs are actually MEK inhibitors as well. So next, sensitivity and resistance signatures were derived from the drug response models for each of the chemotherapeutics, and ingenuity pathway analysis was run on these features, and what was run on these uh, feature signatures. For instance, here, differential regulation of cytokine production was significantly associated with sensitivity to the drug AEW541. Now, these cytokines that are produced in include tumor necrosis factor alpha, which induces insensitivity to IGF-1 signaling. Similarly, AEW541 derives its efficacy from the inhibition of the IGF-1 receptor. So this association is again biologically valid. Similarly, polyamine regulation pathways specific to colon cancer were significantly associated with sensitivity to this drug, FA665752. This drug is a selective inhibitor of colorectal cancer proliferation. So this association is logical on the basis of mutuality. Similarly, death receptor signaling pathways were also significantly associated with sensitivity to the same drug. Now, these particular death receptor signaling pathways involve uh, the components FAS and APO2L as upstream uh, participants. Now, the drug in question is a CMET inhibitor, and CMET sequesters FAS, preventing cell death through this pathway. Conversely, CMET inhibition synergizes with APO2L to induce, induce apoptosis through this same pathway as well. So this association again confirms the biological validity of the adaptive elastic net as a means of identifying biomarkers of drug response. We then applied our framework to identify novel associations between drug response and genomic features and pathways. For instance, here, a missense SNP of the IRAC1 gene was significantly associated with sensitivity to the drug PLX4720. IRAC1 is known to induce tumor growth, metastasis, and angiogenesis, but to our knowledge, this association has never been identified in prior literature. Similarly, a 5' UTR SNP of the LRRC2 gene was significantly associated with sensitivity to serafinib. Serafinib is a RAF inhibitor, and LRRC2 is a close structural relative of the RAS oncogene, yet this SNP has never been identified as a potential uh, biomarker of sensitivity to this drug. Similarly, we identified novel associations between pathways and drug response. Most notably, GPCR signaling pathways were significantly associated with, uh, with resistance to this CMET inhibitor. Now, CMET actually transactivates GPCR in pancreatic and he hepatocellular carcinoma cell lines, and yet the alteration of this signaling pathway, uh, the effects of this on, the sensit on sensitivity or resistance to this CMET inhibitor have never been discovered. So in conclusion, in this study, we improved the accuracy of genomics-based drug response prediction by applying the adaptive elastic net developed by Zhou and Zhang. We then validated our approach through statistical and biological analyses and used our framework to identify novel associations between drug response and features and pathways. Our work has several immediate applications. For instance, it can be directly applied to increase the accuracy of cancer-based drug uh, cancer drug response prediction based on patient genomics, which has immediate translational benefits. Furthermore, future studies could also use our approach to, uh, to identify potential uh, agents for drug repositioning studies, in which uh, drugs used to treat one cancer are, used, are tested in related cancers. Similarly, corroboration of the novel uh, associations identified in our study through in vitro experiments would both further confirm the biological validity of the adaptive elastic net and yield new options for treatment. So I'd like to thank my mentor, Dr. Andrew Beck of Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Harvard Medical School. I'd also like to thank the Harker teachers, especially Mr. Mike Pistacci, Mr. Chris Spenner, and Ms. Anita Chetty. 
I'd also like to thank my parents for their love and support. And finally, I'd like to thank you, the audience, for your time. Thank you. Okay, so as before, we're gonna take some of the questions that were submitted through the Connects Me app. So first, did you go into the project knowing much of the jargon and technical terms, or were those acquired along the way? Uh, I'd say it was a mix. Uh, certainly, before the project, I did a lot of uh, reading of prior literature just to uh, give me a background, especially review articles in uh, scientific journals. But at the same time, a lot of it really, uh, in I guess for any research project, a lot of the technical knowledge has to be acquired in the process, and that's part of what makes it so interesting. Okay. What or who has had the greatest influence on you as a student researcher? Um, I think that um, being, uh, being in an environment that encourages STEM research, such as, for instance, being at Harker and also being in the lab, has really uh, influenced my way of thinking about research, thinking about science. And it's, I think that a big part of why I chose to pursue research in the end was that there was such an encouraging community, uh, both at Harker and outside uh, in the Bay Area for this kind of process. Okay, uh, next we have a question probably from a fellow senior, very amusing. Do you think your linear algebra class and Gil Strang have strongly affected the reasons for pursuing and conduction of your research? Uh, well, obviously, um, my research does involve some aspects of linear algebra and which were learned in that class. Um, I'd, say, I'd say yes, it has affected um, my research, but at the same time, I feel like a lot of research projects, especially in computational biology, integrate, uh, fr uh, integrate knowledge from multiple classes, uh, and so you can't really identify any single class as being the catalyst. It's more of like the combination together. Wow, eloquent response. Okay. Um, <laughs> how did you get the idea for your project, and how did you begin your research? Uh, so, um, I'd had an experience in my previous project, my previous bioinformatics project, with uh, studying drug response and studying uh, what are potential biomarkers of drug response in cancers. And so, through that process, I'd, uh, I'd realized that a lot of uh, cancer drugs have related mechanisms of, a mechanisms of action. And for instance, there are certain biomarkers that are, uh, that are almost universal across a broad spectrum of drugs. Um, so when I read about the adaptive elastic net in prior literature, uh, and I read about how it can incorporate relationships between response variables into its learning, then I realized that this will be the perfect algorithm for this project. Okay. Um, what are some of the advancements you see being made in the treatment of cancer because of your research? I think that uh, my research, as well as a lot of studies in the field today, uh, focus on more accurate prediction of, uh, of uh, dr drug response, specifically like, you know, for instance, uh, lowering the dosage a patient has to take in order to achieve a specific biological outcome. And I think that uh, obviously this is theoretical, but going forward, uh, a lot of this research, if applied um, and validated through s stuff like in vitro, uh, in vitro uh, studies, in vivo studies, has the potential to uh, more, um, greatly change the way we see cancer and the way we treat cancer, especially with all the genomics data that uh, is being collected of cancer patients nowadays. Okay. Uh, what is your favorite subject in school? What are you planning to study in college? And also, are you going to do any follow-up research on this topic? Um, okay, so, okay, one by one, I guess. Um, so, my favorite subject in school, um, I really don't have one. Um, uh, I, I thought a lot of classes were great. Physics C was great. Um, biology was great. Spanish literature was great. Uh, okay. Um, in college, uh, I kind of want to study, um, I, I think currently what I'm going to do is uh, s uh, probably something computer science related. I'm definitely going to continue to pursue bioinformatics in college. I'm not sure yet whether that will be my major or just something I do outside of class. And what was the third one? Uh, 
Uh, do you plan to continue research oh. on this topic? In yeah, college? so one thing I'm looking into is applying this uh, algorithm to other uh, other public data sets. There are several out there that I'm interested in looking into, and that would provide further uh, validation of the results presented in the study. Okay, and then last couple of questions. Looking back, what is one thing you would have done differently for your project? Um, I feel like uh, I would have begun earlier. There, there, there was some stuff I, w uh, some stuff I would have done that in the end did not get done because simply because of the timeline of research competitions and such. Uh, I feel like, other than that, it pre it went pretty well. It was a pretty good run for this project. What was the most challenging part of the research process? Um, the the most challenging part was, I guess, coming up with the idea with the necessary like background knowledge to realize that this, firstly, this is a problem, and secondly, like what are the characteristics of this problem and how can we best solve it using the tools we have. Once that background knowledge was accumulated. All, the, all that was left to, was to let it all like coalesce together. And, but I think like the initial accumulation of that knowledge through like uh, probably like my previous research experience was the most difficult part. Okay, we can take maybe two questions from the audience. So if you want to raise your hand, if you have a question, I can bring the mic to you. In what technology area was the adaptive elastic net first developed, and how did you, how did you make the transition to thinking that could be used for genomics-based cancer drug response? Sure. So the oh wow, that's loud. So so the can, uh, so the adaptive elastic net was first developed by a team of researchers, uh, Zhou and Zhang. Um, they published it in 2009 in the Annals of Statistics, I believe. Um, it wasn't, there, there weren't really initially many uh, applications of this to the area of drug response prediction of, of Zhou and Zhang's algorithm. But um, as I said before, when I read about its properties, the properties of this algorithm, and when I read about, and when, and when I combined that with my previous experience with cancer drugs and their characteristics, I thought that this product would be perfect. Uh, so, how exactly did you represent mutations in your feature set? Sorry, can you can you repeat that? How exactly did you represent mutations in your feature set? Right, mutations. Uh, since they were SNPs, uh, the point mutations, they were represented as binary variables, either one or zero, and there were, I think, on the order of tens of thousands of mutations. Okay, uh, I think that's all the time we have for questions. So, thank you very much, Jonathan, and we have the panel coming up in probably ten minutes. So, see you there.